But anyway, this week what we're going to talk about is uh, part of electrochemistry that's actually quite uh, useful and it's far afield from most uh, chemists, especially analytical chemists, but I think it's a, an important topic because it, it ends up being probably a very technologically important area of chemistry and that's the idea of semiconducting electrodes. And it's also very interesting to people that are doing physics and in semiconducting materials because it gives you a lot of information about the processes that are occurring in semiconductor materials. Uh, so what I want to talk about is semiconducting electrodes and the properties of some, some photoelectrochemistry that we can do with semiconducting electrodes. At the end of today, if we get through this, we'll also talk about some work on um, uh, synthetic organic electrochemistry in industrial applications. And we'll finish with that. Okay. Well, in order to understand semiconducting electrodes, the normal thing to talk about is what they call the band model of conduction. The band model says that when a solid is a solid is formed, there's a large number of atoms per square centimeter. About five times ten to the twenty-second, in fact, atoms per cubic centimeter. And that large number of atoms in one particular spot means that there's going to be a large overlap of the energy levels that exist in each of those atoms. So there's going to be overlaps of energy states. And that overlap of energy states is what we're going to be considering as our band model. Let's consider the idea of two atoms separated by some distance. And those two atoms, if they're far apart, have energy levels that are characteristic for the atoms that you might calculate or you could uh, simulate using some program, quantum mechanical program. As you bring those two atoms together though, the energy levels start to interact with each other. And so from distances of infinity to zero spacing, the energy will change. And we're going to get a splitting in the energy levels at some point. At some point, the energy levels are distinct because they're so they're uh, they're the same energy levels because they're so far separated. As they become closer and closer, the the electrons cannot exist in the same space with the same energy levels, and so there will be a splitting, something like that. And at some point, the energy levels will be a minimum and split. So at that point where there's a, a minimum of energy is tends to be where if atoms are going to be together, that will be the stable point at the energy. Now for a large collection of molecules, instead of just a splitting, there's going to be as many energy levels as there are at, uh, at atoms in the system itself. And so what you do have is a conduction band, what they call a conduction band and a valence band. For example, if I can draw this, let me see. You're going to have a band where there is essentially no electrons normally, and then there's going to be a band where there'll be a larger number of electrons. this one on the top, the conduction band. And the bottom, the valence band. Now, in our scheme of things, if we have this sort of a consideration where the valence band and the conduction band overlaps, those types of materials are typically thought to be metals. Metals have high conductivity, electronic conductivity, and they conduct under all conditions essentially, um, when they're cold and when they're hot, when they're um, irradiated with light or not, they tended to conduct electricity. 
In the intermediate zone, there is a region that they'll call, we'll call semiconductors, where the metal, and the valence band and the conduction bands do not overlap, but are, are closely spaced. And that would probably be in a region, uh, say here. At some point, the conduction band and the valence band become so widely separated that we can think of the material as insulators, and insulators have the property that they tend not to conduct electricity except under very extreme conditions where we have a very high applied voltage and so on, where there's a very high driving force for that process. So insulators act almost as if they are uh, existing as separate isolated electrons. And you can think of this uh, arrow as the interatomic spacing. All right. Now, the electrons in a material tend to populate the valence band because that's where they would be normally. We'd have electrons that are in a valence band and the electrons in a conduction band would not normally be present in that particular point. And there's a region or gap between those two points. And we'll call that EG. And that would be referred to as the band gap. And that's where electrons are not found in this material. Electrons are found either in the valence band or they're perhaps in the conduction band. Now, if EG is small, and by small we mean less than KT, where K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the absolute temperature. Or if a EG is uh, less than zero, in the case there's an overlap, that would be a metal. But if EG is less than KT, there is uh, some ability for charges to move. Why is that? Well. All the electrons are normally found in the valence band, but as you see in the metal, the valence band and the conduction band are, inter, are mixing. They overlap in energy levels. Now, electrons, if there was no conduction band, the electrons would be confined to the valence band alone, and the valence band is completely full of electrons. So there is no ability for the electrons to move around in the valence band. You can think of that as a, uh, if you had a, uh, a game of Chinese checkers or you had a, a set of marbles on a sheet and you packed it as full as possible in that sheet. Well, in order to move one marble from one part of the sheet to the other, you have to move some other marble first. It has, so there has to be a hole or a vacancy in that marble zone. Same with the electrons. Now, in order to do that, what we can do is we can promote electrons to the conduction band, which is now empty of electrons and in that point, the electron can now freely move around the conduction band because there's, it's got a free ability to move. And also the uh, electrons that are left in the valence band can, are free to move as well because there's a vacancy left below. Well, in a metal, because of the big overlap between the valence band and conduction band, there's always a free, a, a large amount of vacancies in the valence band uh, for the materials to move around. So that means that essentially sets, suggests there's a high conductivity of the material. With semiconductors, the situation is not quite so uh, nice. The material, the electrons in the valence band have to be promoted to the conduction band, not through direct overlap, but due to the fact that there's a statistical a distribution of some of the energies of those electrons. And because of the temperature, some of those electrons can be found in the conduction band because the Boltzmann distribution suggests that that's where they would be. At that point, there are now vacancies in the valence band, so electrons can move around in the valence band, and also those electrons that have been promoted through the thermal effects are now free to move around in the conduction band. So you do get some conductivity with semiconductor materials in that process. 
if the gap is greater than KT, so when, when charges can move freely, when it, the gap, energy gap is less than KT or energy gap is less than zero, typically those would be considered to be metals at, in, uh, in a, when it's much, much less than KT because there is almost no barrier then for the electrons to be promoted to the conduction band. Now, if the gap is much greater than KT, the materials can be considered to be insulators because there's really no way that thermal excitation alone can get an electron from the valence band to the conduction band of the material. Uh, we'd have to use some other means, such as a photo excitation or some other non-thermal method to get those electrons up there. And since all the spots are filled in the valence band and there is no electrons in the conduction band, there's no conductivity of the material. There's no possibility of conduction. So we would call those insulators. Now, if EG, however, is approximately the KT value, then those are what we call semiconductors. As I said just briefly before, that allows some of the material to be promoted to the conduction band due to statistical effects. And either due to heat effects, normal thermal effects, but also light now can be a very effective promoter for electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. Now for silicon, the band gap energy for pure silicon is 1.1 eV, which corresponds to a light frequency of 1090 nanometers, which is in the infrared. For germanium, which is another intrinsic semiconductor, the gap is much less, 0.67 eV, or um, 1700 nanometers. So it doesn't take much thermal energy, long wavelength infrared radiation, are plenty of energy to get those electrons into the conduction band. What is the EV? EV stands for electron volts. Is that the same voltage? Well, it has the same units and it scales on the same scale. Um, but it's the, it's, the, um, it's the energy an electron gets when it's accelerated uh, by a, a potential difference of one volt. And you can convert that energy to um, uh, photonic wavelengths and so on to give an equivalent amount of energy. So the gap would be essentially, uh, I'm saying in silicon, it says there's about a one volt difference between the gaps. For germanium, it's about 0.67 volts of difference. All right. Now, if we draw a little diagram, what's happening in our system under those conditions. We can skip our fancier diagram and say, well, here's the conduction band energy and here's the valence band energy. So we'll call the E sub C is the conduction band energy, E, e sub V is the valence band energy. And the difference here would be EG. Remember we said under now, we're talking about semiconductors generally, so what can happen is that some electrons can be promoted by thermal or photons, thermal energy or photonic energy up into the conduction band. And when that happens, they leave behind entities that we call holes. Holes are the space left by the electrons that have been promoted, and they're just gaps or energy in, in just like when we take a marble out of our pan of marbles, that hole that's left over can be thought of as a physical entity. It's not really, it's just the absence of an electron. But in many respects it acts just like a, um, a an entity of itself. And that hole can move around and it can be, be by the under the influence of an electric field it will move and so on. So holes can move, I'm sorry, when electrons can move, not holes, and holes can move, 
under the influence of electron electronic field. So when we're talking about semiconductors, we're going to talk about the movement of both holes and electrons. Right in the middle of our system is the average energy of the electrons in the system, and that's the Fermi level. We talked about the Fermi level, I think, the first day here, and that's the average energy of the electrons in the semiconductor. We talked about it in the context of solution energy levels, but in a uh, semiconductor or metal we store would have a Fermi level as well. Normally half of the electrons, the, that would be the average energy of all the electrons in the system. Uh, the fact that some electrons are promoted to the conduction band has no real effect on the Fermi level because there's lots of electrons and only a few, relatively few number of those electrons are promoted to the conduction band at any particular point. Okay. So we'll talk about some things later where we'll use the term n sub i, which is the number of conduction band electrons. So N stands for electrons, and P stands for holes. And we'll use CB to stand for conduction band, and VB to stand for valence band. Now for intrinsic semiconductors, and those, those are semiconductors that are acting as semiconductors in their pure state, and germanium would be examples of that. The number of electrons and holes have to be the same. N sub i and P sub i, I should say, have to be the same because the holes are directly produced from the electrons. And that tends to, that is approximately 2.5 times 10 to the 19th times an exponential function of the band gap energy and the Boltzmann constant. So it depends on the temperature and the band gap. At 25 degrees C in silicon, the, the number of electrons and holes, n sub i and p sub i, is about 1.4 times 10 to the tenth per cubic centimeter. So it's actually not a large number of those materials. It seems like a large value, but when you consider the total number of atoms that we've got in the system is about five times 10 to the 23rd atoms per cubic centimeter, we've got a factor of 10 to the 12th less free electrons moving around than we had atoms in the first place. So that's not a huge number of free electrons. So intrinsically, silicon and germanium are not really well conducting materials. The advantage of semiconductors, though, is that they can be easily modified to change the conductivity. Uh, metals, you can't easily modify the conductivity. They're conducting. And they can be a little bit less conducting, but we can't use them to, we can't easily modify it by adding elements to it. Whereas silicon and germanium can be easily modified to have different levels of conductivity. Not only that, at different levels of conductivity in the same basic bulk structure or they can have different sensitivities to photonic energy or thermal energy. And so that makes them quite useful. Now the energy, electrons and holes that are in the system can be considered to be just like ions. So we can think of electrons diffusing in a system, we can think of holes diffusing in a system, and we can think of those electrons and holes migrating in the presence of an electric field. Um, they are like ions in solution, but they are moving typically much faster than ions in solution. So for silicon, the, the electron mobility, U sub n, is about um, 1350, and the hole mobility is about 480, which would be centimeters squared per volt per second. So you can see that electrons move much faster than holes under the influence of an electric field. So whenever we have a system where we have electrons and holes in the system, the electrons are going to carry more of the current if there's equal numbers of electrons and holes because of the faster mobility or higher mobility of those materials. They can move more rapidly in, 
in the system. And you get to see why that is. The electrons are basically rattling around in essentially an empty conduction band, whereas the holes have to, they have to move sort of in, in a somewhat concerted motion. Something has to fill in one place and something has to move in somewhere else. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why we see a difference in the, in the mobility. Well, you can think of the holes as uh, dislocations or empty spots in the, in the basic chemical structure. You can think of a broken bond, for example. And so they're not necessarily bigger in this, I don't know if you can really call it, have a physical size. But uh, in order to have a hole move, for example, if it's a broken bond, one other bond has to break and the other one has to make. So that's part of the reason why it's slower as well. Electrons don't have that problem, but they're in the conduction band. They're all, they're free to, free to move without making or breaking the bonds. So, and I think I have in, the, in your notes about how things, how the electrons and holes would move in the presence of an electric field. And I said the holes have to move sort of by filling in other holes and, and new holes getting made behind. <clears throat> now, silicon and, and um, geranium are intrinsic semiconductors. There's some other ones. Titanium dioxide as a, a bulk material, as a pure material, is a semiconductor. Has a band gap of about um, 3 eV which means that the energy required to promote electrons into the conduction band is about 410 nanometers. That's well into the ultraviolet region. And so titanium dioxide also works, but its band gap is much wider. And so we don't use it as much as a semiconductor for electronic purposes, but it also, it has some useful purposes that require to absorb electrons in the UV region. Intrinsic semiconductors are not very useful, just like a pure metal is not always that useful to us as chemists. We don't use pure iron. We don't use pure carbon generally uh, for our purposes. We always admix, admix something else into it to improve the properties. And that's one of the things we do with semiconductors is by adding other materials to it, we can get what they call extrinsic semiconductors, which in which case we can change the hole and electron density and change the mobility, change the band gap by adding new materials. And by adding certain materials together, you can make semiconductors that were not semiconductors to begin with. And so you get a much wider uh, degree of, of, of adjustability in this way. It's like organic chemistry. By adding bonds together, you can make a very wide variety of compounds not available from just carbon and oxygen or nitrogen. So what we'll do is we'll add what they call dopants to the material. And dopants just means impurities. And those dopants are often referred to as either acceptor or donor uh, materials. And you can think of dopants as kind of like acids or bases or, or redox sort of species. Uh, acceptors act to accept electrons, and do do donors act to add electrons to the system. So let's suppose we say, let's add arsenic to silicon. The arsenic is a group five material, which means it has five valence electrons, and silicon ha is a group four material, and so, if we do that, arsenic is donating electrons to the structure. So arsenic is acting as a donor in this case. And so the number of electrons now is gonna increase by the amount of arsenic that we've added. Because arsenic, remember, has five electrons in the valence shell, whereas silicon only has four. And so silicon, without only four in there, has a low level of electrons and holes that are performed naturally, but as we add arsenic, we're gonna add increasing amounts of electrons to the whole bulk material. When 
when we do that, we have to adjust our energy levels. We're going to change the um, the we're going to change our energy structure so that we have a new energy level. We'll call ED, which is the energy of the dopant material. And it tends to be close to the conduction band. And I'm drawing this in a, in a way that suggests that there's, it's kind of equally spaced, but in fact the donor is much closer to the conduction band than the, the valence band. Typically we'll find that to within about a 0.005 EV, which is well within, much less than the KT uh, value. So what happens then is that statistically almost all of the dopant energy levels get promoted in the conduction band of the bulk material. So all of the atoms of arsenic that we add to it get ionized and are found, all those electrons are now found in the conduction band of our material to start with. Some of course will still be promoted from the valence band to the conduction band, but that's usually going to be much less, depending on how much dopant we add. But the point will be that we're going to add probably a lot more dopant than we have naturally occurring electrons or holes in the system. So the number of electrons is going to be approximately equal to the number of dopant atoms that we add. Now the number of holes that we've got that are available in the valence band is much less now. Because before all the electrons had to come from the valence band in an intrinsic semiconductor. Now those electrons are coming out of the donor and so the holes that are left in the valence band that are free to move and conduct electricity are, are there's only just the original amount, which is much less typically. And this is one of the reasons why when they make semiconductor materials they have to be very, very careful about purifying the result. For example, suppose our dopant is present only in one part per million. And that would be a very difficult purification process to remove even one part per million of dopant, although they can do that. So the number of dopant atoms is equal to 5 times 10 to the 16th per cubic centimeter. That's a million times less than 5 times 722 we already talked about. So that means that we've got um, that many electrons typically available for conduction. Remember under normal at room temperature we said that the number of electrons is about 10 to the 10th. So here we have about a million times more electrons in the system than we had before. So the conductivity will change dramatically by even one part per million of dopant added to the system. The number of holes left behind is going to be equal to, or the number of holes in the valence band is going to be equal to the number of electrons um, divided by the number of dopant uh, atoms. I, I use this in an incorrect way and I'm sorry. Let's, uh, this notation N sub I refers to intrinsic electrons. So in other words, N sub I always refers to the number of electrons that are present normally in the pure material. So that would be the, about five, 10 to the 10th again. The number of electrons that is present is not N sub I when we've added dopant. We've increased the number of electrons. So P sub I is still equal to N sub I, but P sub I is less than the number of electrons. 
because the number of electrons comes from not only the intrinsic but the dopant atom as well. So and so number of electrons here is not n sub i, but it's number of electrons. So p sub i is still the number of intrinsic electrons squared over n sub d. So the number of electrons that we've added by the atoms. And so for one part per million arsenic, the number of p materials is down to approximately 4,000 per cubic centimeter at 25 degrees C. So there has to be, there's a balance here. So as we increase the number of electrons in the balance band by the donor, we basically use up those holes that would otherwise be there. Uh, remember, there has to be electrical neutrality in the system. So if we go back to our diagram, the reason there's not more holes than there already are is that normally there would be some holes coming from the valence band, but because there is some charge in the don't from the donor atoms, we still have to maintain electrical neutrality. So that's why the number of intrinsic holes has now dropped in our system from about five times 10 to the 10th to about 4,000. Okay. When we do this, then we, when, then we have some new notation. Conduction band electrons are what are going to be what they call the majority carriers. They will conduct the most of the electricity. Not only are electrons much faster in mobility than the holes they left behind, but there's many, many times more than there, there are of holes. So the, the valence band holes are the minority carriers. So even though there is majority and minority, there still is conduction by both, as you'd expect, but just much less. This type of material in which the majority carriers are electrons are what we call n-type semiconductors. So those are donors. The acceptor idea would be similar. Things are turned around a little bit. But let's suppose we add a, uh, a material to silicon that was um, an acceptor material. In other words, let's add some gallium to the system. Gallium now is less valence electrons than silicon, and so will tend to produce an excess of holes in the system in the valence band because what's going to happen now is our diagram is such that at the conduction band level and the valence band level, we will have a level E sub A, which is close to the valence band level. Being left behind are the holes. Oops, that's not what I wanted to draw. Let's try that again. The holes or the electrons will be produced in the electron acceptor level, leaving holes in the, in the balance band. In other words, those uh, electron deficiency that are present in the gallium gets filled by electrons from the valence band in the bulk material. So the silicon essentially donates electrons to the acceptor material, which is gallium in this case. So what we have now are electrons in the acceptor level, holes left, by, left behind in the valence level. We still have some naturally occurring 
electrons that get promoted to the conduction band and the holes for that reason as, as before. So in this case, the number of electrons in this case is equal to the intrinsic number of electrons squared over n sub a, just like before. So n is approximately 4,000 per cubic centimeter in silicon with one part per million gallium. And that's just like it was with uh, arsenic and silicon. But now the electrons have dropped dramatically and the number of um, holes is around five times 10 to the 16th per cubic centimeter. So in this case, this would be what they call a P-type semiconductor because the holes are the majority carriers. If we consider the Fermi level in our system, it still is the same definition. It's the average energy of, of the electrons in our, in our system. An alternate way of saying the same thing is the probability of energy state being occupied is one half. So if we have an energy state at the Fermi level, it would have a one half probability of being occupied. Now, if the Fermi level, E sub f, is near the center of the band gap for intrinsic semiconductors. In other words, it's going to be right in the middle. Now, the probability is one half. There's, in fact, no states in the gap for the electron to be at, but the probability still is one half because of the statistics of the system. For uh, N-type semiconductors, it's going to be near the conduction band and that would be um, like this one here. The Fermi level is going to be near the conduction band because we've added all of those donor uh, electrons. And so now the number of electrons has increased dramatically. And so the average energy is going to be near the, uh, the donor and, and uh, conduction bands. And it's going to be near, alternately, the valence band for p-type systems. So this is we remove a lot of electrons from the valence band, the Fermi level now is going to be close to the valence band energy. And this is okay as long as we're, we're having, uh, in this case where we're talking about, we've added so much dopant that the natural intrinsic amount of material is, is, is overwhelmed. So as long as we're in the, say, the part per million range, or in other words, the number of donor dopant atoms is is on the 10 to the 17th per cubic centimeter. So we're talking about 10th of a part per million and more, of, or no, 10 part per million and more of the material. All right. Let's take a look back, if we, if we want to look at the Fermi level a little bit more carefully, let's take a look back at our definition of the Fermi level and let's apply it to semiconductor. So the Fermi level of a phase alpha is the defined as the electrochemical potential so of an electron in phase alpha. So mu 
bar e to the alpha. So the Fermi level in alpha phase is equal to mu bar alpha e minus e that times the potential and E would be the charge on the electron. And this would be the inner potential, remember. So in order to take an electron out of our system, have to take the electron from the uh, valence band. And so let's suppose we wanted to take an electron from a metal. Well, the Fermi level is going to be basically inside the valence band uh, system, of the system. And so we're going to have a what they call a work function. is the energy it takes to take an electron out of the metal into the vacuum. And the work function ends up being the same as the Fermi level energy in, of the metal. And so we find that for a Fermi level for a metal is about minus 5.1 eV. Now uh, because we know the band gap of our silicon is, um, and we can do calculations, I can't do the calculations, but people can do the calculations. And for metals, I think it says about pi, minus 5.1 eV, which means that the, the uh, energy is less of an electron in the metal than in the vacuum, which is what you'd expect. Uh, you don't see electrons being present normally as a gas in a vacuum. They're, if they're present, they're collected all in the metal. So they're not being sputtered off by the metal into the vacuum normally. But for a semiconductor, the, Fermi, the energy, the electrons are still more stable in the semiconductors, but less so because now the Fermi level has risen into the, uh, into the gap between the valence and conduction bands. And it turns out to be about minus 4.8 uh, EV for silicon. Now for a, um, so for a silicon we can draw a diagram something like this. The valence band is here, the Fermi level is here, and the conduction band is here. We still have the work function of the, elect of the electron, of the, of the surface, which is again the energy it takes to take that electron away from the Fermi level into the vacuum level. And we can also consider what they call an electron affinity, which is what the energy how much energy it would take to put that electron onto that semiconductor material. That's just going to, for an electron to go into the conduction band. So E sub A is the electron affinity. So we have a work function and electron affinity that can characterize a semiconductor surface. So by measuring the work function of our material, we can get an idea of the Fermi energy levels, and we can see what the difference is from a semiconductor and a metal is. All right. Well, let's think about that in the terms of, of doing some electrochemistry with our electrons in a semiconductor. In order to do electrochemistry, we have to know a little bit about the energy levels of the, of the electrons. Remember when we first started out when we talked about if we put a metal electrode in a solution, the Fermi levels of the metal and the solution have to match up at equilibrium. In other words, the electron energy has to be the same in the solution and the, and the, and the metal. Otherwise, we would get always a net flow of electrons from one way to the other. 
Same thing is the case for a semiconductor solution interface. The Fermi levels of the semiconductor and the solution have to match up when we put them in solution together, or a solution in solution with a semiconductor. So again, remember the Fermi level of a solution is the average energy, the electrochemical potential of the electrons in the solution. So if we compare that energy level, we find that the E0 of the NHE, remember the NHE is defined, the normal hydrogen electrode's potential is defined as, as zero uh, under most scales, but we said that that was an arbitrary designation. Now, you can actually calculate what the E0 is of the NHE when you use it, reference it versus the vacuum energy level. So here we have a vacuum energy level of electrons in the system. So what energy level is the NHE on that scale? What's the energy difference between the electrons in the vacuum and the electrons energy at the NHE E0? Well, it turns out if you calculate it, it is approximately minus 4.6 EV. So as you'd expect, the electrons, again, are more stable in solution in the NHE system than they are in the vacuum. We don't have electrons being sputtered off in the vacuum from our, from our system. So, but that's a, a different way of assigning a potential scale to our system is versus the vacuum level rather than uh, versus the NHE. The reason we don't normally do that is the vacuum level has to be calculated and it's not necessarily uh, a completely rigorous calculation. So people tend to use, again, the NHE as a, con a more convenient reference point. All right, so let's take a look at our energy now versus the vacuum level. So in the vacuum, we would have a, a level, and it takes a quite a, a bit of energy to get down to the average energy of electrons in, say, a gold, a metal. And um, we can have our semiconductor is say an n-type electron uh, semiconductor, so the Fermi level is close to the conduction band. And we can have a, a solution. And remember the Fermi level in, uh, in our system can be whatever, in the solution it can be whatever as well. It depends on what species we've added to the system and depends on the relative concentrations of species O and R. Now, if we plot versus uh, NHE or versus the vacuum energy level, we find that uh, down the scale that our hydrogen ion proton, which is the NHE level, is again at minus 4.6. And then other species are down, farther down the scale. For example, the iron three plus two plus species is about uh, 0 0.77 on our NHE scale, but on our vacuum energy scale is minus 5.4 EV. Suggesting again the electron energy is lower in the iron three plus two plus system than it is um, than the other system.